welcome our next headlight talk speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to give you a little uh, quick bitey intro on my, uh, about me. Uh, I took to writing about sustainable design and inclusive design practices right out of grad school, right, right out of the oven. And uh, I'm glad today that I have a platform where I get to advocate for gender inclusive practices in design. So uh, my talk today is about gender inclusive UX and e-retail in the fashion and apparel industry space. Um, Though we are designers, there's a lot we learn to incorporate in a design that we pick up in our experiences as consumers. Somewhere around that, we put ourselves in different shoes of the users, the consumers, the people. It's where empathy begins. So let me start with a scenario where you and I will step into new shoes. Just for 30 seconds, stop. Uh, consider yourself a salesperson at a clothing store any clothing store, from Zudio to Zara, anything. Let's say I walk in as a customer and I ask you for a shirt for myself. What would you do next? You would probably ask me what style, color, fabric, size, whether it's for workwear or casual wear or something of the sort, yeah? And what would you do next? In my experience so far, my best guess is that you would probably lead me to the women's section and show me what's available. In this scenario, what is, so that's 30 seconds stop, that, that's my time. Uh, but in this scenario, what is something that you would have inadvertently assumed here? Probably that I'm a woman. That's an assumption based on your perception of my gender presentation, which means how you perceive my gender based on my behavior, my hair, body characteristics, or, or even voice. Um, and a lot of these assumptions also translate into digital experiences, where we see these on e-retail platforms. We have uh, options in feedback surveys and sign-up forms where there is binary gender, op where there are binary gender options used. There's gendered language. There is um, these platforms that offer gender-specific product recommendations. So let's look at some of these gendered categories. Uh, what I have here is a few cases that are screenshots or screen grabs of commonly known clothing websites. And I'd like you to look at the hero sections here and observe something. Uh, if you can see, uh, let me lose. If you could notice that you see the options that say woman, man, women, men, shop men, shop women. And similar categories there to women, men, girls, boys. And this is a common observation across um, global platforms. So think of it. Before a user, a potential customer, has even scrolled any further than the hero section of the website or app, which is the first thing, the first banner you see, it is already assumed that they will fit into either pronoun. Options such as for him and for her are associated with, or rather assumed for, men and women respectively. In doing so, not only is the pronoun presumed for the user browsing, but it is also, arguably, an unintentional misgendering that contains the experience of non-binary and gender-diverse customers from the get-go. The idea that there are only two genders is referred to as a gender binary, because binary means having two parts, and in this context, male and female. Therefore, non-binary is a term used to describe genders that don't fall neatly into one of these two categories, per se. For my talk today, I will be using the terms non-binary and gender diverse as umbrella term. Um, before I jump to this, uh, think of the experiences you've had while you go, to, go on a shopping platform to purchase something. You must have gone through something called onboarding forms where you may have seen, but probably not taken due notice of, the use of uninclusive language and options. We see them on sign-up forms, login forms, uh, and some such. So here's an example of what shows up in the profile details, which is the information that is collected from these forms, basically. And we see the term gender has been used, where I get two options to choose from. And not only are there only two options, male and female, to pick from, 
They are also sex characteristics and not gender identities. So given such options, I came to a few questions. How inclusive are they? Uh, why do we need them and do we really need them? So the first question is rhetorical, so I'm going to skip to the second. While there are cases such as medical forms where you might have to ask for sensitive demographic information, there are many cases where asking for such personal information is, uh, is frivolous. Um, now in the fashion industry, asking for personal sensitive data might be used for a couple of things, like personalization for instance. Um, you, might, you might think that knowing a user's preferred gender identity can help suggest styles, fits and sizes that align with that particular user's gender pre uh, pre preferences. It can also aid in inclusive marketing where brands can get insights into how they can be more respectful to their customers by using inclusive, uh, appropriate imagery and appropriate uh, um, uh, imagery in their marketing materials. It can also aid in product development where brands can understand where their users are coming from, what are the uh, diverse identities of their customer base. Um, so let's imagine that if we are asked such personal questions, we would probably be wary about where the information is going, what is it going to be used for. So it's important when asking about such data that we handle this with sensitivity and transparency, clearly explaining why the data is needed and how it will be used to enhance the customer's experience. Moreover, it is just good practice to offer the option to skip or uh, opt out of providing such information in order to respect user privacy and individual customer comfort levels. And now coming to if we really need them. I may sound a little judgy, but uh, don't take that on me. Uh, there's nothing right or wrong here, but if you answered yes to this, let's take a look at the next few examples that could help challenge that notion. Uh, first things first, before I jump to the examples, we can probably agree on uh, simply avoiding asking a question when it's not necessary, right? So don't need, don't ask. Here's an example of a fashion brand called MX Apparel, and this is the form I saw when I first visited the website. As you can see, that there's no uh, ask for my gender preferences or anything about my gender info. I also like how uh, their nav bar shows product-based categories instead of gender-based categories. So in some examples earlier, we saw how options that read men, women, girls, boys. But here, product-based categories instead aids in providing an inclusive approach. So these simple things are, uh, for, to me, a good example of how when sometimes it isn't needed, you can probably avoid asking a question, and you can probably think of a different way of categorization. So here's another example of a fashion brand that goes with product-based categories. And here's another. You can take a moment to look at the options if you like. One of many, there's also an Indian brand that aids in showing size and gender-inclusive representation, along with uh, product-based categorization. I like how there is no assumption of, I'll move out of the way so you can see it. I like how there's no assumption of pronouns or limited gender options. The co-founders of this brand believe that people do not fall in prescriptive boxes. They exist within the gray. And this notion of uh, the spectrum and a rejection of the binary is what has led them to create their vivid line clothing and the conceptual thinking behind this brand. Isn't that beautiful? So as said by uh, former editor at LBB, Sunana Patnayak, the best kind of fashion is the one that defies all labels. And fashion is no longer about asking yourself, is this made for my gender or can I even wear it? If you like it, go ahead, wear it. It's, it's about you, it's not really about the clothes. As UX designers, we understand that we're not just doing something for the sake of it. We're not rounding some corners there or adding some buttons randomly just because. No, we understand that while we're making a certain design decision, we're doing it consciously for a given purpose. 
We are doing it to aid in functionality, usability, and experience. Uh, this is where we learn to question the whys. We, know, we start asking why is something needed, or is it even needed? Why do we need to know their gender? Can it be eliminated? Can we uh, maybe A-B test to see which is really working to provide the potential customer with a better user experience? So if any of this got you thinking, please hold your thoughts, because I have more things to add. Let's look at algorithmic gender bias in e-retail platforms. This happens, th this occurs when algorithms that drive product recommendations to you, the target advertisements and search results to you, uh, reflect and perpetuate biases present in the data that they were trained on. So here's an example of a study that was done in uh, 2021 by USwitch. Uh, for context, USwitch is a comparison and switching service, and they tested a series of objectives on smartphones that included the Samsung Galaxy S21 and iPhone 12. And what they found in the derived results was that automated suggestions on predicted text are often gender biased. What they did was they used this phrase on smartphones that said, you are a dash, where a word was inserted. And they found that of the 236 objectives tested, 72% suggested a gender-biased response overall. And on iOS, almost two-thirds of words generated a male-biased response. Uh, let's look at another example that shows such a bias. Princeton University researchers did a study in 2018 where they used off-the-shelf machine learning AI software to analyze and link 2.2 million words. And it, the search results determined that the words woman and girl were more likely to be associated with the arts instead of science and math, which were more likely to be associated with males, by which I think they meant men. So let's look at a similar bias uh, in word associations, but on clothing platforms. So here's a search I made on a popular Indian uh, e-commerce platform for fashion and lifestyle products. And as you can see, uh, out of curiosity, I looked up unisex items. These were the search results that showed up, tagged unisex. And of the 15,800 and something items tagged unisex, about 4K were caps, 26 were baby shower caps, and 8 are shower caps and headbands but zero were clothes to put on the body. So given that unisex is probably not a very common search, I went with some commonly searched for products, but this time I didn't want to see what would show up in the search results. I wanted to see what would show up in the autocomplete predictions when I was entering the searches. So I looked up trousers, dress, and t-shirts, and it was interesting to note how gendered the autocomplete predictions could get. Note how normalized it is to gender trousers, t-shirts, and dresses. How we have trousers for women and trousers for men. But it's not typically something that we would expect to find under anything tagged gender neutral and or unisex. What this does is it reinforces a gender binary in a way that people beyond the binary may often find themselves feeling left out or invisible. It not only hampers user satisfaction, but also affects the potential customer base for businesses. Because think of it, the people buying from Mintra, Amazon, Zara, Agio, and, and several other fashion and apparel platforms online aren't just men and women or girls and boys, or those who go with he, him, and she, her pronouns. It is important to understand this in the socio-cultural context. Where do these inherent biases come from? According to a search, uh, a, a study done in 2018 by a UK-based charity, it was found that 31% of non-binary individuals and 18% of trans folks didn't feel comfortable wearing work attire that represented their gender expression. Now, this was in the UK context, but coming to an Looking at it from an Indian e-commerce context that doesn't particularly uh, or exclusively target a young millennial or Gen Z audience per se, um, most product marketing is advertently or inadvertently uh, 
something that perpetuates the gender binary. And a lot of it undoubtedly comes from social norms, cultural norms, where a binary understanding of gender is prevalent. Men, women, girls, boys, that's how we've been conditioned to think. And often anything beyond that can seem harder to comprehend, especially for those of us who identify within the binary and or those who didn't see put mainstream media representing gender diversity enough. What this does is it, um, it kind of leaves many of us who identify beyond the binary or out of it question our feelings. But there's a positive side to it. Uh, these are some positive stats that I collected and I was very happy to know that uh, looking at the Gen Z age bracket specifically, about 50% of online shoppers globally have purchased fashion outside of their gender identity, and about 70% consumers are interested in buying gender fluid fashion in the future. And while that might look like a changing, growing picture, uh, it is important to note the lack of such data in the Indian context. And that is because a lot of official surveys conducted, uh, conducted in India are in the binary format. So we miss out on getting accurate stats on gender neutral clothing consumption in India. I really do hope that changes. That uh, speaking of change, and on a brighter note, despite the current data gap that looks something like these words to me, change is underway. I believe that with every passing day, we learn more about our shared experiences with people from the world over. This, this helps us march towards a changing scenario where we can expect to find ourselves in a world that is more kinder, more understanding, and more respectful of the experiences of those we find different from ourselves. I think it's a great time to be a designer, to be in the design space, where you and I have a powerful voice, the power to influence, and do so for the better. I think today more than ever, we, we find that it's having that empathy is what will make us realize that users aren't really users of our products, but are people using it. It is that empathy that'll, that'll tell us, okay, this is how you become a good designer. Some, seeing something as simple as the they, them option on different platforms feels validating. When I see Instagram say they have mentioned you in their story or you reply to their story, it feels good. I'm sitting scrolling through my feed thinking that, hey, somebody on their design team has tried to put themselves in my shoes. They've been considerate and have accounted for my experiences and my preferences. Looking at the pronouns I go with on application forms for jobs um, feels good. Making one feel seen, feel heard, can be so validating. And I think this may come from me being a designer as well as a consumer, like I said at the beginning that I feel that that validation shouldn't be something that feels extraordinary to experience. It should be normal. Inclusivity shouldn't be an afterthought or something that brands suddenly market themselves practicing during Pride Month. Practicing an inclusive approach in design can aid in many ways. And I feel that to sum up my talk so far, I found these words by senior product owner at Adidas super enlightening. I'm going to read it out. Today, the majority of users, uh, millennials and Gen Z, see gender as a spectrum rather than the binary, something that would have been hard to imagine a decade ago. And isn't that so? If we look at our parents, we look at our ancestral generations and how we've taken a leap to come where we are. This should only go forward. Practicing an inclusive approach in design also supports the sustain UN Sustainable Development Goals, such as gender equality and reduced, uh, renew, reduced inequalities. It can help us drive the way through sustainable design, aiding in inclusion, uh, economic and social inclusion for everyone, not just for the selected few or people who fall within what the society considers as valid. We design often on the principle of familiarity in UX, right? While seeing binary options may feel familiar because we're so used to it, it is important to question what that familiarity rests on. 
Is it perhaps negligence? Is it perhaps ignoring the experiences of a significant part of our customers? And must we keep on with it? I could, if I could give a penny for every time I've heard, oh, this is probably all right. Uh, why, why, why is there a need to complicate things? It's fine the way it is. It is fine for some, but not quite for some alike. And if it feels complicated, simplifying it is our job as designers, isn't it? So on that note, I'd like to leave you with these words by Luke Christu. That's it. I'm going to read it out again. People want to be seen, heard, and most of all, represented. An authentic understanding of what representation truly means and how it relates to the struggle for inclusion and diversity is most likely what fashion can do to be more inclusive. I think it's most likely what we as designers also can do to be more inclusive. Uh, with that, I hope to have struck a chord with you, even if it's in the smallest way possible. Uh, that's my time. Thank you so much. Yeah. If my parents are watching this, they, they don't know because I haven't come out to them yet. Wow. But please go yeah, ahead. But, yes. uh, I, I was in the US recently, and it seems to be a lot more opening culture elsewhere. I'm sure it'll catch up here too. But I was just curious, is this a, a pet project of yours or is it like a thesis work? What is um, the source of it? Uh, for my capstone project in, in college, which was what I did my thesis and dissertation on, okay. I was looking at a similar area, but it was around e-commute and commute in general, where uh, a lot of our experiences aren't really designed for people beyond the binary. Right. I thought of taking that generic idea ahead and applying that in a more, in a different scape. I thought of choosing e-retail fashion apparel because it's a very simple thing. I love using Mintra, but there are things that cause hiccups for me as a non-binary and uh, as, as someone who identifies as non-binary and a woman. And those were the things I wanted to address because I shouldn't stop loving a platform that I like using right. because they couldn't be more inclusive. Yeah. I think they can j definitely go ahead in that direction. No, absolutely. Thanks for starting the change. I'm really happy. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, there were certain points that I felt, okay, um, that in the past, even I'm as, a, as a designer, I could relate to you know, certain brands being more inclusive about um, you know, the clothing and as you brought out the categorization. And there are some brands that don't bring in categorization, like gender. They don't have anything of that. What do you think about, um, now I'm going to get it, I'm going to go more broader. Okay. Like you have c countries like Russia, right, where they have completely banned the whole concept of this pride, right? And that same ideology is then, you know, passed to the brands that operate within Russia. Right? So there are many countries like that. What's your take on that? How, how in those cases inclusivity can be achieved in those cases? Like what, if you have any direct point or indirect point to it? That's slightly a loaded question, but, I, but it's a very valid question. It is, um, thank you for asking me that because that's not, some, that's not as far as I had ahead as I had thought uh, within the scope of uh, my topic and my research for this presentation. Um, I think uh, with, uh, with a brand considering a lot of changes um, in the voice that they have projected out there is probably a little different in every country and what's the political scenario, the cultural scenario in that particular country. It's not going to be the same everywhere, but if there's one word that comes to my mind that is adaptability, I think it's, it's good to be fluid. There are um, if, if I was running any of them, I would probably try and be more subtle about making those changes in a way that it doesn't really um, scream that, okay, this is change. But there is change happening, smaller steps, baby steps, but uh, it's a spark. It's, it's, a, it's one way to go ahead. It may not apply everywhere, like you mentioned, that it, it's important to be sensitive to the cultural scenarios of every, of every country, of every regional place. Yeah. And if you look at India, you go, you go down south, you go up north, yeah. there are going to be differences. If you study those differences, you'll see the patterns and you'll understand where it is.
probably okay to make those changes and in some places where it's more okay or it's easier to make those changes. So it really depends on a lot of factors there. Thank you.